Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Teen News Plus. Thanks for tuning in today. I'm Amy, and I'm guest hosting for Trace all this week. This is episode four of five of our series about the Gemini program. So far, we've talked about the Gemini program's origins after Mercury, its role in paving the way to the moon with Apollo, how to travel in space for a long time, and how to step outside the spacecraft to perform a spacewalk or extravehicular activity. Today, we're going to talk about the oh-so-complicated task of rendezvous and docking in space, which is super important not only if you want to go to the moon, but if you want to build anything in space, say an international space station or a large spacecraft to take to Mars. If this is the first episode of the series you're watching, be sure to go back and watch the episodes you missed. And also make sure you subscribe to get episode five tomorrow. We'll be talking about splashdowns and how to return safely from space. But now, let's rendezvous. Rendezvous and docking is really two mission events that happen as kind of one mission event. We'll take them together. Rendezvous is really simply the joining or the sort of meeting of two spacecraft in orbit. And docking is their physically connecting such that if you have two dock spacecraft, you can move between the two of them. You can imagine rendezvous, the difficulty of orbital rendezvous. Imagine you are on one side of your house and your friend is on the other side of the house. You each have a tennis ball. Your goal is to throw those tennis balls such that they hit each other at the top of the arc over the roof of the house, but you can't see your friend and you can't really see the trajectory of his tennis ball. That's kind of how difficult orbital rendezvous is. You have two objects moving at tens of thousands of miles per hour around the Earth, and you have to somehow get them to connect to one another. If you think about what you do when you want to meet up with something or someone. Say you're driving in your car and your friend is driving in the car ahead of you and you want to catch up to them and you want to pull up beside them. We know how cars work. We know that we have friction against the road. If you want to ma match your friend's speed and get up next to them, you just go towards them and you put on a little bit of speed to match their speed, get up next to them, and then you match them and you, you meet them. That doesn't work in space because in space, when you're orbiting the planet, the faster you go, the higher you go above the planet, which means the further from your target you go. So that instinct of fast and towards doesn't work when you're doing an orbital rendezvous. Orbital rendezvous is actually a very intricate dance of slowing down to go a little bit below your target and then coming back to circle around and meet them from the other side. You have to have this intricate balance of matching the speed, knowing that that any speed you gain or lose using small thrust rockets, that's gonna adjust your orbital plane just a little bit, and that every little bit matters when you're dealing with space. Rendezvous was a huge goal for Apollo because NASA made the decision to use lunar orbit rendezvous to go to the moon. So on the lunar missions, the main spacecraft with the fuel and the big engine to return to Earth was going to be in orbit around the moon while the tiny little lunar module landed on the surface. And it would be up to the, the astronauts would have to rendezvous to connect their two spacecraft around the moon when coming back from the moon's surface. So NASA needed to figure out this rendezvous goal in the relative safety of Earth orbit before sending men a quarter of a million miles away to do this where no one could help them. Uh, not that anyone could really help them in Earth orbit, but for Gemini, instead of having two astronauts in separate spacecraft, only one of which could come home safely because the lunar module couldn't exactly come back to Earth on its own, that rendezvous had to happen. NASA used an unmanned target vehicle for the Gemini astronauts to practice rendezvousing and docking with. This was called the Agena target vehicle, and it was really just a, a target practice for the Gemini spacecraft. The spacecraft could dock with it, it could use the Agena's fuel tank and engine to increase and decrease its orbit, and it was also just a great, a great practice target for the for the astronauts. They could tether it together and try to spin the Gemini and the Agena together to try to create some artificial gravity. It was a really great learning tool for these guys. Gemini 6 was the first mission to use the Agena target vehicle as a, a rendezvous and docking target. Um, the Agena always launched before the Gemini crew, which in Gemini 6's case didn't totally matter. Gemini 6 did not get off the launch pad when it was supposed to launch. This was the only launch abort of the Apollo era. The, the engines fired and then immediately shut down and the crew didn't need to eject um, to, to get away from a rocket. It didn't explode, but the launch was postponed by months. So NASA now has this missed goal on its hands. It was supposed to rendezvous with the Agena and it couldn't. And now the mission has to be reset. So NASA thinks up this really interesting idea. Okay. The two Gemini spacecraft can't dock. They don't have the right mechanisms to join up together. 
But the Gemini spacecraft was incredibly maneuverable. The astronauts likened it to almost flying a fighter jet in space. They all talk about it like it was just this really sweet little ride. So NASA says, why not launch two Gemini missions more or less together and have them rendezvous and have them just come really close to each other so that the crews get a sense of what it means to rendezvous. Gemini 7's long duration mission in space, its 14 days in orbit, was punctuated by a quick visit from Gemini 6A, which was really just the Gemini 6 mission launched under a different designation. Gemini 6 and 7 got within feet of each other such that the astronauts could actually see each other through the small half moon windows on the spacecraft. They were so close that they could even read signs that they would hold up in the window. There was a bit of an inter-service friendly rivalry between the astronauts of the Army and the Air Force and the Navy. On Gemini 6, they held up a sign that said, Beat Navy, in the window, because Gemini 7 was an all-Navy crew, and the crew of 7 could actually read it in the window of Gemini 6. So Gemini 6's mission was pretty quick. Um, They weren't up very long. They went home after they went back down to Earth after they accomplished that rendezvous goal. And um, Gemini 7 mentioned that it got really lonely up in space, even though they couldn't interact really. They were still talking over radio. They didn't step outside. They didn't couldn't you know touch new people <laughs> or share new air. They still said that it felt very lonely to suddenly be the lone two men in orbit. The next mission, Gemini 8, was the first to successfully rendezvous and dock with an Agena target vehicle. The crew, Dave Scott and Neil Armstrong, connected to the Agena and then used it to maneuver in space a bit. But they realized that they started spinning. And spinning is not really what you want to do in space. If you've ever been in like the ride, like the Gravitron, you know that as you spin and the forces that build up can, you know, make you feel kind of weird and you can't lift your arms. But if the forces get high enough, you can black out. So this isn't really a good situation. The crew suspects that the problem is with the Agena because this is still a relatively new vehicle and the Gemini at this point has flown enough that they feel confident in it. So they separate from the Agena and their rate of spin gets worse and it gets worse. They're revolving one once a minute, essentially. They were spinning so much and they were pulling such high G-forces that both astronauts started to black out just a little bit. They could barely lift up their arms against the forces they were pulling. And th- I mean, this is very nearly like, if this doesn't stop, we could actually lose two astronauts in space well before we go to the moon. Neil Armstrong knows the inside of that spacecraft like nobody else. He manages, even though we can't totally see straight, he manages to figure out what's going on. One of the thrusters is stuck open on the Gemini spacecraft, and that's what's making them go in this this uncontrollable spin. He figures out to turn on, and knows where the switch is, which is the amazing part, turn on the retro rockets, which are the rockets that are used to deorbit, to slow the spacecraft so it starts falling back through the atmosphere. He uses those to cancel out the spin, essentially saving his life, Dave Scott's life, and the mission. And it was, I mean, that was an incredible, incredible bit of flying. The crew really almost died. But then they didn't, so that is good. But because they used their fuel for the retrofire burn early, they had to come back early too. And this this crew ended up in in an unideal uh, contingency landing area, but they did make it home safe and sound, as we know, because Neil Armstrong should be a familiar name to pretty much everybody, as he was the commander of Apollo 11. So with Gemini 11 and again on Gemini 12, NASA really nailed the rendezvous and docking goal. This was a massive thing for Apollo, because not only would the crew of Apollo have to retrieve their lunar module from an adapter inside the upper stage of the Saturn V rocket, they would have to do the rendezvous and docking again in lunar orbit. and. NASA has still been using the basic understanding of rendezvous and docking to build the space station. This is something that every everybody who's ever flown and built anything in space demands this this technical skill. So for NASA, figuring this out in 1966, really nailing it down in 1966, was another major hurdle on the path to the moon achieved. Tomorrow we're going to be talking about how every Gemini mission ended, and that is with a splashdown in the ocean. And we're also going to talk about some ways they did not return to Earth, because it's a very little known story, but a fascinating one. Make sure you subscribe to get all future episodes in this series. And if you missed any previous episodes, be sure to go back and watch those as well. One of my favorite things about Gemini 8 is that Neil Armstrong Armstrong was the pilot who saved the mission and saved his life and Dave Scott's life. So what do you guys think is more impressive? Successfully getting Gemini 8 out of that potentially fatal spin and saving the mission or landing on the moon in 1969? Let me know in the comments below. If you want to watch more space right now, you can go back and watch Trace talk about the origins of the universe. Or you can check out more videos from me on my channel, Vintage Space. Thanks for watching and see you guys next time.